Hello, everyone, and welcome to Henry Schein series on COVID-19 on YouTube. I'm Dr. Gary Severance with Henry Schein, and each month it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. David Resnick as he gives us an update on COVID-19, and including this month, information on the CDC guidelines. But we've listened to you, our viewers, who've asked for more information on other health concerns that are impacting dentistry. So we're also including that each month. This month, it's more information on monkeypox. Dr. Resnick, welcome. Hi, and, and thank you, Dr. Severance, for the introduction. And welcome, everyone, to our COVID-19 and dentistry clinical update. Today, we're going to do a little bit of stretch. We're going to talk about where we are with COVID as usual, and we're going to bring in a new disease that is getting a lot of attention uh, around the world, actually. So with that having been said, let's get started. First, we'll have our disclaimer slide that we always show, and I'll keep it up just for a minute. So the beginning part of our presentation today will be about COVID. That's what this has been about for the last two and a half years. I sometimes feel I've been the bearer of really bad news. Um, I don't have bad news to share about COVID at this point. So I want to start on something positive. So if you look at our new reported cases and you see the average number of cases that we're seeing, we had that big January surge from Omicron. But if you look at where we are in July and August, it's sort of been flat. If you look at the positivity testing rate, that number has actually been going down. Hospitalization due to COVID, we see a little bit of an increase, but still nationally, it's going down. The only thing we're seeing an increase of regretfully at this point of time are some deaths. But for the most part, the number of new cases is going down. The testing numbers are a little bit off because a lot of people are testing at home. And when you test at home, those numbers do not get entered into your state department of public health. So it's only when you actually have a lab-based test that those numbers show up. So a lot of people are testing at home, taking great precautions. I think we've had a really pretty fabulous summer. Uh, we've been able to go out to restaurants, back to the movies, uh, ball games, everything that we sort of had been limited on for the last couple of years, we're able to do once again. And I think that is fabulous. I've been to more restaurants in the last few weeks than I probably have been in the last year. And it's just been a, a pleasure. Get to socialize with folks again, not be uh, trapped in your home or et cetera, et cetera. So it's really a positive time. But I don't want us to let our guard down, which is why we're talking about this today. The known daily cases have fallen by more than 15 percent in the last couple of weeks. And that's almost in every state. So whether it's a highly vaccinated state or an unvaccinated, you know, lower vaccinated state, we're really seeing the case counts drop. The national case average, which is about 100,000 per day. So there's still a lot of people testing positive. The first lady tested positive this week. And as I mentioned earlier, we think it's an undercount because people are using at-home testing. And, and I get that. I've used at-home testing as well. The only time I've ever had to use the other kind of testing was uh, we had an outbreak in the clinic a couple of years ago in, in the whole Pont Center. Um, and then before I had to have a little procedure in the hospital. So no more deep noses. Everything seems to be going well. Um, and I think that it's positive news, and I love sharing some positive news for a change. Cases have fallen by 20% or more this month in more than a dozen states. In California, daily case counts were nearly twice as high a month ago as they are today. Again, that is fabulous news. Hospitalizations have declined modestly nationwide, falling about 3% since late July. I will say that my hospital is at max. Um, we have been on a medical diversion for quite some time. Um, we're over 100% full. It's not just COVID. It's everything else that goes on in a major city. But our hospitals are really have been taking quite a hit from COVID. 
At the same time, daily deaths from the virus are increasing. About 500 COVID deaths are currently announced each day, which is an increase of 8% over the last two weeks. Again, if you're at risk, please take all of the necessary precautions, including masking. It's sort of interesting when I go to the grocery store now, you can see where the message has gotten across or people whose families have been impacted, they're, they're still wearing masks in the grocery store. I talk about this stuff every month and have been for the last two and a half years. And when I'm going to the grocery store right now, I am not wearing a mask. I think one of the big issues that we face with these case counts going down is what we do with our waiting rooms. Since I work at a hospital-based program, my patients in the waiting room must have a mask on. If you enter the building, you must have a mask on, and that goes for patients as well as staff. So we have almost 300 people who work in this program, all wearing staffs, unless you're in a private office or it's a couple people in a private office. But it, any kind of meetings that we have, full masking. Walking in the hallways, full masking. And of course, we're taking all the precautions that we have since the beginning of COVID when all the technologies came out that made it easier to purify the air. I basically, the best air I breathe every day is in my clinic. I wish I had some of these things in the house and it's probably something I need to consider, but haven't made the move yet too. So the CDC came out with some precautions and uh, eased up some of the recommendations for the general public for people with COVID-19. This is not what is uh, for healthcare providers. We still have to follow the, the CDC recommendations for healthcare providers, but patients are gonna ask you questions. And so we really want you to be able to answer questions about what the new CDC guidelines mean and how does it impact them. So when you have COVID-19, isolation is counted in days, and this confuses some of the brightest people I know. If you have no symptoms, day zero is the day you were tested, not the day you get your positive result back. So the day you were tested. Day one is the first full day following the day you were tested. So day zero is testing day. Day one is the first day afterwards. If you develop symptoms, regretfully, within 10 days of when you are tested, the clock restarts on day zero of symptom onset. So I hopefully that's pretty clear. It's on the slide. If you have symptoms at the beginning, day zero of isolation is the day of symptom onset, regardless of when you tested positive. As I just mentioned, day one is the first full day after your symptoms started. So this is if you have no symptoms. The first day you're tested is day zero. Day one is the first full day after that positive. Um, if you get symptoms, then it restarts, and that works on, um, for both. So that should be pretty clear. If you test positive for COVID-19, stay at home for at least five days. Those are the days where you are most contagious. And isolate from others in your home. And, and you know, I had a staff member on vacation, tested positive. And we really went by these guidelines for her when she should come back. And it was uh, 24 hours, no Tylenol or, or uh, an NSAID to take um, to reduce fever. So stay home for at least five days, wear a high quality mask if you must be around others at home in the public. Don't go to places where you're unable to wear a mask. Um, I guess that would mean restaurants and things of that sort. Do not travel. Stay home and separate from others as much as possible. We don't want to share the COVID love. Use a separate bathroom if possible. Take steps to improve the ventilation at home. Now, I know we've been through this remarkable heat wave through many parts of the country, and ventilation is probably not what you want to do, opening windows, but it really is the smart thing to do. Do not share personal household items like cups towels and utensils. Monitor your symptoms. If you have issues with breathing, seek emergency medical care immediately. And then there's a link here on what you do if you have COVID. So these are the, the recommendations for the general public, not for the dental office, but for the gentle, gen general public on what you should do should you test positive. 
removing your mask uh, after you've ended isolation and when you're feeling back to normal or feeling good. No fever without the use of a fever reducing medication and symptoms are approving. Wear your mask through day 10. Or if you have access to antigen tests, you should consider using them. Use two sequential negative tests 48 hours apart. You may remove your mask sooner than day 10. So we have uh, antigen testing in my home. Um, I test on occasion just to make sure that I'm staying negative. I think almost everybody in the country, whether you've tested positive or not at this point, has had COVID in one form or another. I have never tested positive. And yes, I, I um, work in, a, in an incredible environment, and I basically for a couple of years really didn't do much. But I think everybody at one form or the other has been exposed. And so we really want to follow these guidelines. If the first lady can... Um, come down with COVID, if uh, Dr. Fauci can come down with COVID, if, if uh, football players are being put on the COVID list, it's still highly contagious. It's still out there and please still take care. The uh, advantage of having your initial two uh, vaccines, uh, your first shot and your, and your second shot, so what the CDC calls fully vaccinated and you listened to me last month, I think that terminology is not good. Um, I think you're fully vaccinated once you've been boosted, but they're calling that up to date. Our boosting numbers in the United States are not very good. Um, I put a slide up uh, last month as well, showing that if you look on the international spectrum on Western Europe and the United States, we're really not doing good with our boosting program. And so we, when new vaccines come out, these boosters come out and they will be coming out within uh, uh, several weeks or so, um, it really is time to consider that because they're going to target the variants that are causing our problems. And so why a new booster? So I know that you might have heard that Moderna has been approved in the UK and in, in England for use as a booster. Um, all three companies, there were three companies that met with the administration and HHS to develop a specific boosters that would hit BA4 and 5. And those companies were um, the Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna, and Novavax. And so uh, all three have submitted their data. They're in the FDA. The federal government has already purchased a large amount of the Pfizer booster. Um, but you will have a choice as to what booster you want. Because Omicron caused such a large number of cases last winter in our hospital, I, if you remember my charts were pretty high at that time, it was the most contagious variant to date and invaded a lot of our infection protection and prior illness and effectiveness of our previous vaccines. We're still living out the true effects of a BA5 uh, summer surge in the U.S. The new sub-variant is thought to whittle away much of the infection protection people got due to either prior illness or even uh, from other variants. So this is the plan. Health officials are asking for new boosters that will target the BA5 sub-variant to be rolled out this fall, which is right around the corner. COVID-19 is still making people sick. It's still causing hospitalizations and death. Yes, we're at a wonderful point right now. We want to stay at a wonderful point, and it's going to take a little effort to do that when the weather changes. The older vaccine formulas are still effective in preventing severe disease, and that is important. But the mutating virus is whittling away some of the protection. Again, the, this uh, strain is the most contagious strain we've seen so far. The benefit of this grain is it doesn't seem to cause as severe an illness. It doesn't really go down into the bottom parts of your lungs, which were causing a lot of the issues we saw two and a half years ago. So the vaccine companies are working on their new formulation. Several have already turned in their data for an EUA, an emergency use authorization, and they need to get both the FDA and CDC uh, rolled out uh, approval before they can be rolled out. 
So the FDA wants a bivalent or a two-component vaccine, which will include BA4 and 5 spike protein, in addition to the older or ancestral strain. The vaccine is currently authorized or approved for only o- approved only older and ancestral strains of the virus. These vaccines still can per- uh, protect you from severe disease and hospitalization, but the effectiveness against infection is becoming more and more limited as you see more and more famous people or more and more people that you might go to church with or at T-ball with and or do, wherever you're socializing, you'll find more and more people are testing positive. And they'll say their symptoms are mild to moderate because they are up to date with their uh, vaccinations. My concern is that only about half of the people eligible are up to date for their vaccines. So we're about 50 percent, and that is not very good. So as medical providers, we're part of the primary care team. Talk to your patients about getting boosted. You don't need to preach about it, but you can say when these new boosters come out, be able to explain that they're targeting the most infectious uh, variants that we've seen to date, and that should keep you and your family healthy. Wherever the modified vaccine are authorized and recommended, we can expect people who are more at risk for severe disease, including older adults and some people with health conditions, to become eligible first. So that is our update on COVID today. There has been something else that's been called a public health emergency in the United States. Um, This will be my third major infectious disease covering in the last several years. First with HIV, then we went into having COVID, and now we have monkeypox. And so that's what it looks like under an electron microscope. And it used to be something that we only would see on people who had done international travel and they would bring it back. But now that has remarkably changed and we are having a pretty significant outbreak in the United States. The WHO plans on renaming monkeypox over stigmatization concerns. The WHO is holding an open forum to rename the disease after some critics raised that the name could be derogatory or have racist connotations. Um, in a statement Friday, the UN Health Agency said it has renamed, renamed two families or clays of the virus using Roman numerals instead of geographic areas to avoid stigmatization of those areas. So the version of the disease formerly known as the Congo Basin will now be known as clade one, and the West African clade will be known as clade two. The outbreak from the United States is from the West African clade or clade two. So again, the the nomenclature is changing. I think for the most part, we're still gonna be calling it monkeypox until they come up with a a new uh, name for it. Um, Right now, since we all know it is monkeypox, I think it's going to be sort of hard to change it, but we'll see. It's a rare disease caused by infection with the monkeypox virus, which is a part of the same family of viruses as variola virus, the virus that causes smallpox. Monkeypox symptoms are similar to smallpox symptoms, but milder, and monkeypox is rarely fatal, and that is very important. It is highly painful. From the cases I've seen here, it is highly painful, and that's something that we need to consider. Monkeypox is not related to chickenpox, so it's not that. It was discovered in the year I was born, 1958, when two outbreaks of a pox-like virus occurred in colonies of monkeys kept for research. So it was identified in monkeys. It was identified a long time ago. Unlike COVID, this is not a new disease. This has been around. It was first discovered in 58. We looked at human transmission. It has been a problem in Africa. And like many of the things that we see, if we don't address disease states in our modern world, where intercontinental flight is no big deal and uh, traveling from one continent to the other and doing projects in different parts of the world, we literally are a global place at this point. When we don't address things in Africa, eventually they tend to come here, and that's sort of what is happening here. We don't really know the source of the disease. 
Um, it could be from African rodents or non-human primates like monkeys um, might harbor the virus and infect people. The first human case of monkeypox was recorded in 1970. Again, I want to stress the point. COVID was new. We didn't know how to manage it at the beginning. We, as dental providers, changed our whole infection control procedures to take into consideration airborne transmission. It was a huge change for us. This is not a new virus. The first case was recorded in a human in 1970. It's a long time ago. Prior to the 2022 outbreak, monkeypox had been reported in people in several central and Western African countries. I listened to a really insightful NPR recording yesterday from a doctor in Nigeria who had been really uh, trying to get vaccine for his patients, for those around him, and vaccine has not made it yet to anywhere in Nigeria. So what happened there, I ended up coming over here. Previously, almost all cases and, and people outside of Africa were linked to international travel to countries where the disease commonly occurs through imported animals. These cases occur in multiple con uh, continents, but it didn't become as infectious as it is today. Monkeypox can spread between people through close contact, skin-to-skin -skin contact, including sexual contact, with a person with monkeypox or contact with contaminated fomites, such as shared linens. And that is a little bit of controversy, but I am going to talk about a, a UK study where they looked in hospitals and, and what happened with linens. So we will talk about that. Uh, for the most part in dental, we don't use linens. If you have a patient, um, we do have one scheduled today that had tested positive for monkeypox, if they're well enough to, co to come in, we will do our, what I would call our normal uh, PPE. So we'll have on our N95, we'll have on eye protection, including you know just glass eye protection or face protection. We will have on a disposable gown. gown. We went over how to uh, doff your, uh, Disposable gown, once again, was staffed this morning just so they would feel comfortable. And so I think that that is our normal infection control that we started based on COVID. So here's the connection. It still will protect us from monkeypox and it will still protect us from COVID. Please do not loosen up your um, uh, infection control uh, protocols that were put in place due to COVID. The one area I think I mentioned was waiting rooms and, and what we do, the ADA uh, sort of suggested that you didn't need to have people masked in the waiting room. Um, for the most part, uh, I, like I'm saying, I don't mask when I'm going to restaurants right now. I don't mask when I'm going to the movies right now unless it's really crowded and I avoid that. Um, but in my waiting room, we're still going to have patients masked. I just think that we are part of a office. Uh, medical provider office where we do have a lot of aerosolization and I want to protect my staff and my patients. That's my number one goal. While anyone can catch monkeypox if they have close contact with someone who has it, regardless of gender identity or sexual orientation, many of those affected in the current global outbreak identify as being gay or bisexual or uh, transgender or other men who have sex with men. Healthcare providers should be alert for monkeypox, regardless of a patient's travel history, gender identity, or sexual orientation. Reported contact with someone who has monkeypox or has a rash suspicious for monkeypox may assist with clinician decision making. We need to look at the whole patient. During summer, we see a lot more of our patients. People come in with shorts. They might come in with t-shirts. Um, so we always do a great extraoral exam. We do great intraoral exams, but it is okay. Look at people's hands and arms. Look at the skin that's available. Uh, during HIV lectures, I used to say, you know, Kaposi's kind of sarcoma is going to show up for some strange reason. It shows up around the ankles. For some strange reason, it shows up on the nose. And so look at the whole person. 
when we're dealing. We just aren't working on dinner forms. We're working on people and we can actually help our patients and get them linked to care. Healthcare providers should be alert for monkey, as I said, monkeypox, regardless of a patient's travel history, gender identity, et cetera, report a contact with someone who has monkeypox, who has a rash suspicious of monkeypox, may assist with our decision making. Again, I want to stress we're part of that team and we can really, truly help get this under control. So here are the states, the darker blue states, who have the highest case counts. Um, Georgia is now over a thousand cases, and I can remember when it was 25 cases. I can remember when it was 50 cases. We're now over about 1,100. Uh, California has been hit pretty hard. New York, Illinois, Texas, Florida. So you can see the areas with the big metropolitan areas, at least some of the bigger metropolitan areas in the United States, getting hit pretty hard. Uh, by this uh, orthopox or monkeypox um, um, virus. In Georgia, with 402 clinical assessments performed, so I like talking about my, my own state and my own hospital, and I could even talk about my own program because we have a significant number of monkeypox cases showing up. But in my state, 625 positive cases were identified and commercial testing, which 99% are men, one is a woman. The majority of cases in Georgia and in this outbreak nationally are in men who self-reported as men who have sex with men or with sexual or close intimate contact reported within 21 days prior to symptom onset. We expect to see cases in close contacts of persons who are infected regardless of gender identity and age which is really why important why we get people identified, get those suspicious tested, and we have medication. The age range is from 18 to 66, and the median age is 34 in Georgia. So this is more of a younger person, and, and I say that seriously, a younger person's illness than it is someone who is my age, but although it gets up to close to my age. Most of Atlanta's cases affect gay, black men, many of them are HIV positive as well. 82% of our monkeypox cases affect black men who have sex with men, 6% Hispanic, 1% female, and it's actually less than 1% female, and again, the median age is 34. 67% have HIV, which is a remarkably high number, but that number could be skewed because we are doing a lot of testing in our HIV programs. 85% um, of those with HIV have viral suppression, meaning they can transmit HIV to another person sexually, but they can get monkeypox. So again, here we are back into a situation where we can't transmit HIV, undetectable means untransmissible, but you can get monkeypox, and we are seeing some cases of it. The initial symptoms of monkeypox are upper respiratory or flu-like. However, they do not show up for two weeks after someone is infected. If you are exposed and infected with the virus, it has a very long incubation period. And I think that's something to, to deal with. The symptoms include a very prominent fever, body aches, pains, headache, and fatigue. And so without the fever, I think a lot of us at some time have body aches, pains, headaches, and are tired, but the fever is the thing that sticks out. As the body fights these symptoms, you can get lymphadenopathy or enlarged lymph nodes, and this appears as an initial symptom. I can say I missed a case in the oral health center. Um, weird case of, of what looked like an ingrown hair. There was lymphadenopathy. Um, it wasn't something that I thought about monkeypox. When I look back upon it, I should have referred him downstairs for testing. We did refer him downstairs because of the lymphadenopathy, but the patient did have monkeypox. So we've already seen them, and I missed one, and I look for these things. And so that's why I'm sort of stressing what we need to look for and what we can do, and also following our fabulous infection control protocols that we all should have in place. The symptoms then progress to a rash, and it oftentimes is found on the hands, feet, face, mouth, and even genitals. These rashes transform into raised bumps, 
and painful putts filled red papules or darker papules depending on the race of the person infected. And so I'm going to show you a couple of cases here, I think, in a few minutes, which will show you what the, I will just go ahead and show you now what these look like in someone of African American uh, descent. Look at the palms of the hand. When we normally see a palm on the hand, the first thing we think about is syphilis. This is not syphilis. What you're seeing here on this patient's back and on this patient's hand are actually images of monkeypox courtesy of the CDC. I'll go back to the previous slide real quick. The symptom list has been expanded to include a single lesion or lesions on the genitals, anus, and surrounding area, lesions in the mouth and symptoms of proctitis, anal or rectal pain and bleeding, and that is what we're really seeing a lot of here and a lot of pain, especially if the individual has had a new sexual partner recently. So again, if we can identify some of these symptoms, we can refer them over to primary care, refer them to a place that is doing testing, um, if you have patients who are at risk for monkeypox, then we can refer them to testing centers or vaccine centers because we've had an issue with getting vaccine out. There was a problem with man not with manufacturing the vaccine overseas, but putting it into the, the bottles that it needs to come. So now instead of giving a full dose, we're doing sort of like an intradermal or TB test with, uh, have you ever seen a TB, had a TB placement or just goes gently under the skin, that's how we're using it at one fifth of the normal dose. So hopefully we'll have enough vaccine for anyone who wants to get vaccinated, can get vaccinated. Back to those pictures that I showed you. Again, just look at the hand lesions and the back lesions. I will be showing you some more pictures as we go through. And this is an oral ulcer secondary to monkeypox. And so the mouth is always the window to the rest of the body. About 20 to 25% of the people can have pharyngitis or can have difficulty swallowing. And we'll talk about this as well. The CDC and American Dental Association urges healthcare providers to be on the lookout for monkeypox symptoms, including oral lesions. So if I would normally see this lesion in the posterior oropharynx, Based on my experience with HIV, I would say it's either aphthous or neutropenic ulcer. The issue is aphthous ulcers tend to be recurrent. This doesn't look like a recurrent, but you can talk to your patients. Have you had these before? Um, so this is actually a single oral ulcer in the posterior oropharynx that popped up and was the main cause of pain for this individual. So they really want us to be alert for symptoms that are consistent with monkeypox, including oral lesions. But as I mentioned previously, look at the palms of your hands of your patients. Just, don't be obvious. You don't have to be like, you have monkeypox. Just do a full exam like you normally would on all of your patients. How is this transmitted? Monkeypox does not, and I want to explain, uh, emphasize this. It does not pass through through casual contact like shaking hands, a quick peck on the cheek, or sharing a toilet seat. I'm always amazed by what people think they can get from sitting on a toilet seat. Uh, if so, it can be theoretically transmitted by touching clothing or sheets used by people with open sores and through the air if someone has mouth sores, but that is through droplets. As of this point, this is not something that lives in an aerosol. But at the very beginning of COVID, we first heard that it was droplet transmission. So we're going to keep an eye on this for you and get you the latest information. But right now, it is droplet, not aerosol. There seems to really require a close, prolonged skin-to-skin -skin contact. And if it wasn't, we'd have millions of cases right now, and we really don't have that. So it's not something that's aerosolized at this point. It's not something that you get by casual contact, um, by shaking hands, toilet seat, et cetera, et cetera. But how does it spread? It can spread through anyone, regardless of sexual orientation or identity, through close, personal, and often skin-to-skin -skin contact, including direct contact with monkeypox rash, scabs, or body fluids from a person with monkeypox, touching objects, 
fabrics, clothing, bedding, towels, and surfaces that have been used by someone with monkeypox. And actually, even though this is in the CDC slide, Emory ID, infectious disease, really is thinking that the fomite issue has been sort of overblown. But in the hospital setting, of course, we're going to be looking and changing our clothing and bedding and things of that sort. Contact with respiratory secretions. We shouldn't be in contact with respiratory secretions. We should have our N95s, our face shields, our eye protection, our, our gowns, our gloves, the whole nine yards. This direct contact can happen during intimate contact, including oral, anal, and vaginal sex, or touching the genitals. Um, I think we mostly know what our genitals are, or the anus of a person with monkeypox. Hugging, massage, and kissing. And I am going to show you a case that came about due to kissing. Prolonged face-to-face -face contact, which I would think would involve kissing or cuddling. Touching fabrics and objects during sex that were used by a person with monkeypox and that have not been disinfected. So including bedding, towels, et cetera. So it does spread through close personal contact, uh, long contact, not, not short-term, shaking hands kinds of contact. A pregnant person can spread the virus to their fetus through the placenta. Right now, it is really not showing up in women, but at the beginning of HIV, it really wasn't showing up in women. And it's sort of interesting, even in Africa, the majority of the cases are in males. It's also possible for people to get monkeypox from infected animals, either by being scratched or bitten by the animal, or by preparing or eating meat or using products from an infected animal. A person with monkeypox can spread it to others from the time symptoms start, and I think that's important, and time symptoms start until the rash is fully healed and a fresh layer of skin has formed. This illness lasts about two to four weeks. So again, this is not something that you get that you're going to have a lifetime full like HIV. It's not something that's most likely going to put you in the hospital except for pain management. And it is a self-limiting disease that we have treatments. And I think that's also very important. So we know how to detect it. We don't have to do that kind of research. We have vaccines, although the vaccines we have are not really specific to monkeypox, they are uh, to a, a close relative of monkeypox, and so therefore we're finding that they work, which is important. So scientists are still looking for answers, and I, I honestly will say, although the messaging from the government on COVID has sometimes been confused or, or different, messaging on monkeypox has been spot on, and, and I do want to give the CDC credit. If the virus, so what are they looking for? If the virus can be spread by someone who has no symptoms. How often monkeypox is spread through respiratory secretions and or when a person with monkeypox symptoms might be more likely to spread the virus through respiratory secretions. Whether monkeypox can be thread through, uh, spread through semen, vaginal fluids, urine, and feces. These are questions we're still looking at because for the most part, this was something that wasn't impacting Western part of the world. And again, we need to do better with addressing some of these diseases like we're doing with Marburg virus and several other uh, viruses that show up in Africa. If we could address it in the source country, then we can eliminate it from coming here. So this is an interesting study that I found on air and surface sampling for monkeypox virus in the United Kingdom hospital. They identified widespread surface contamination, 66 positive out of 73 samples, and occupied patient rooms. So these were hospitalized patients on healthcare personal protective equipment after use and in doffing areas. So remember how important it is for us to take every precaution because just like, and I know my patient population is a little bit different, but just like we treat every patient as if they have a bloodborne pathogen, we treat every patient as if they have an airborne pathogen, uh, something that can be aerosolized. We really want to take special precautions on the equipment that we use and the areas that we doff. So our patients, our patients, our staff have been told to doff in our soiled room, which has negative pressure in, in my clinic. 
Five out of 15 air samples were take were positive. Significantly, three of four ants, uh, air samples collected during bed linen change in one patient's room were positive. Replication competent virus was identified in two of four uh, samples selected for viral isolation, including for air samples collected during the bed linen change when you're shaking things out. If we're using the tools we have for making the air quality in our programs better, have a filtration, extra oral uh, evacuation systems, uh, relief systems, high volume, all the different things that we've been doing, we should be fine. What's really important, because we do aerosolize a lot during our work, is to make sure if you're suspicious that the person has uh, some unusual lesions, please go ahead, take care of the patient, Stop in an appropriate area and make sure the patient gets a referral. Or if you want to, you can reschedule until you know we know more. The data demonstrates significant contamination in isolation facilities and potential for aerosolization, although it has not been proven yet, of monkeypox virus during specific activities. PPE contamination was observed after clinical contact and changing of bed linens. We don't worry about changing of bed linens, but we do use high volume evacuation. So we really want to make sure that we're changing our filters, that we're keeping our airborne precautions up to date. Additionally, contamination of hard services and doffing areas supports the importance of cleaning protocols, PPE use, and doffing procedures. So. Again, follow your manufacturer instructions for use on your wipes. Make sure all of your hard surfaces are wiped down after treating every patient. Uh, due to COVID, we have truly limited what is outside in the oral in each operatory to the most minimal things that we can have because we don't want them getting um contaminated with COVID, et cetera, et cetera. So we do take every precaution. And I as I've been somewhat preaching for the last two and a half years, the, the importance of keeping the staff healthy, the patients healthy, our community healthy really is of primary concern. So what are the American Dental Association infection control recommendations? And I'm gonna read the quote here. Dentists have provided, I would say dental healthcare workers have provided care using standard infection control precautions for several decades now and the enhanced protocols implemented during COVID-19 pandemic will continue to keep our patients and staff safe during this monkeypox emergency, to, uh, said by a, a colleague and friend of mine, Dr. Mascarenas, who is chair of the ADA Council on Scientific Affairs. Use of appropriate PPE, including uh, respirators and gloves. I'm gonna change from masks to respirators and gloves surface cleanings, and extra diligence when examining patients for symptoms and the characteristic facial rash and intraoral lesions to identify a patient early are imperative. So again, we always do that soft tissue exam, look for something unusual. Not everything that we see is going to be monkeypox. Not everything that we refer is going to be monkeypox. But we're being safe by recommending for people who may be at risk, who are showing up with a weird rash, to get tested and that way they can protect others. It's just like in HIV care, when people knew their status, they were 70% less likely to put somebody at risk. If someone knows they have monkeypox, they can actually seek treatment because there is treatment, and I think that is important. As I've been mentioning, we have so many methods available now in the dental practice to remove splatter and aerosol, including high volume evacuation and use of rubber dam, intraoral shields, extraoral suction and, and evacuation, ambient air treatment, including air filtration, and in some cases, negative pressure. Uh, as I said, very few offices have a negative pressure operatory. Since I was given the opportunity to open up a program during COVID, I do have a negative pressure operatory. It was, it's a little bit over the top, but we will be using it today for that patient who tested positive for monkeypox. Vaccinations. CDC recommends vaccination for people who have been exposed to monkeypox and people who may be more likely to get monkeypox. People who have been identified by public health officials as a contact of someone with monkeypox, 
people who are aware that one of their sexual partners in the last two weeks has been diagnosed with monkeypox, people who have had multiple sexual partners in the past two weeks in an area with known monkeypox. So remember that map I showed you. We have several large states, several large metropolitan areas who have a higher level of monkeypox. And remember, that was California, that was Texas, my home state of Georgia, the state I was born in, Florida, New York. And then there are other states who aren't quite at that, in Illinois. There are other states that aren't quite that level, but are having a significant outbreak of their own, like Massachusetts. So again, try to stay aware, follow our updates, but look at the CDC track on where we are with COVID in your community. Just like we look at uh, COVID transmissions to see how our community transmission level is, we can also look at um, COVID, excuse me, at monkeypox and, and taking precautions based on there. So I work in an HIV program. We know there's a lot of people with HIV who are showing up with this disease. And so we're doing our normal everything we had done before. So I'm glad that we're prepared now and we're not in the situation we were. And we actually know about this disease, unlike COVID. People whose jobs may expose them to monkeypox, such as laboratory workers who perform testing for orthopox virus, laboratory workers who handle cultures with animals with orthopox virus, and some designated healthcare or public healthcare workers. We are not jabbing the people in the dental clinic. We are not jabbing people in our treatment and holding area who are doing the jabbing, so or, or giving the vaccine. Um, so uh, these are lab workers. And remember, the only case of HIV transmission uh, to a healthcare worker in the last 20 plus years was actually a laboratory worker working with um, uh, blood, of, uh, HIV bl uh, blood from someone with HIV who was not on treatment. So again, we want to protect our laboratory, our medical lab workers. These are not dental lab workers. These are not dental staff. Um, my staff has not requested to be uh, vaccinated, and honestly, the hospital is not recommending it at this point. Treatment. So there are no treatments specifically for monkeypox virus. However, monkeypox and smallpox are genetically similar, which means that antiviral drugs and vaccines to protect against smallpox may be used to prevent and treat monkeypox virus infections. Antivirals such as T-pox, may be recommended for people who are more likely to get severely ill, like patients with weakened immune systems. So there was a lot of paperwork as this is off-label use, um, but it uh, looks like that paperwork, uh, which was so heavy, such a burden, some of those burdens are being reduced. So it's easier to get the medication. If you have symptoms of monkeypox, you should talk to your healthcare provider, even if you don't think you've had contact with someone who has monkeypox, or in a group that seems to be more at risk. There's nothing wrong with getting tested if you feel like you've been exposed. Most people with monkeypox, as I stated much earlier, fully recover within two to four weeks without the need for medical treatment. It's a self-limiting disease. Pets in the home. So I'd like to welcome you to my family room. These are my two little dogs. The one on the left is Grady. Uh, Grady was, we had uh, events for when you've been at a, the long-term people who have been employed at the hospital. So this was, we picked up Grady the day of the 25th anniversary of my working at Grady Memorial Hospital or Grady Health System. So after one cocktail, we decided to name our new Westie Grady. And the Shih Tzu on the picture is Timmy. And these are my little pets and they're my family. And so I think it's important that we protect our, our animals. Infected animals can spread monkeypox virus to people and it is possible that people who are infected can spread monkeypox virus to animals through close contact, including petting, cuddling, hugging, kissing, licking, sharing sleeping areas and sharing food. So I will tell you that close contact with my animals, uh, my family, uh, Grady and Timmy, includes petting, cuddling, hugging, well, not so much on the kissing and licking, um, and they control the bed. 
we don't share food. Um, they do stay on dog food, but they rule the roost. I, I just sort of rent from them. And so they're very important in my life, just like your dogs or your cats are very important in your lives. Animals uh, are, are, um, are, for someone like me, I don't have children. They are my children. And they never grow up. Regretfully, they also don't learn. Pets in the home. People with monkeypox should avoid contact with animals, including pets, domestic animals, and wildlife to prevent spreading the virus. If your pet is exposed to monkeypox, please pay attention. Do not surrender, euthanize, or abandon pets just because of a potential exposure to monkeypox virus. Do not wipe or bathe your pet with chemical disinfectants. I can't see anyone on this call even thinking of this, but do not wipe your pet with chemical disinfectants, alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, or other products such as hand sanitizer, counter cleaning wipes, or other industrial surface cleaners. If the person with monkeypox did not have close contact with the pets after symptom onset, at friends or family members who live in a separate home to be the animal's care tables until you're better or until that patient gets better. Close contact, as I mentioned, includes all these different things. And I think if you're sick and you're ill and you can't be around your, your pets, it can be have quite a, a mental health component to it. Pets that have had close contact with a symptomatic person with monkeypox should be kept at home and away from other animals and people for 20, 21 days after the most recent contact. Infected people should not take care of exposed pets. The person with monkeypox should avoid close contact with the exposed animal, and when possible, ask another household member to care a member to care for the animal until a person with monkeypox is fully recovered. So again, we're going to try to take care of our family members. What am I concerned about the most? I already deal with the most stigmatized. Uh, disease in our country, which is HIV. And imagine this, a MARTA train, which is uh, Atlanta's rapid rail system, was evacuated. It was disinfected after a rider overheard someone saying they have monkeypox. The rider reported the conversation to uh, MARTA police, which halted the train at one of our stations. They evacuated the train. EMS was brought in to assist the person who claimed they were sick. The MARTA officials said the empty train was taken to the rail yards to be cleaned and disinfected. No word of the person actually tested positive for monkeypox. So what we're seeing again is something that is already becoming highly stigmatized in our country. And all people, no matter sexual orientation, gender identity, white, black, Asian, it doesn't matter. If you have a disease, you you have a disease. And our goal is to identify it and get them into gear and get them healthy. That is what our goal. Please, if you hear people being judgmental, it could happen to them. And we don't want that to happen. This is someone who I actually found on Facebook, of all places, who was showing what happened to him after kissing. And I wanted to give you this example. This was not someone that had sex with the individual uh, on, on, on his page. He did say that he was highly flirtatious and he kissed uh, different people at the bar. But this was no sex. This was just kissing. And you can see the awful lesions around the mouth, the lesions he had on his hand, lesions on his leg. The top left was the initial presentation. And remember I told you I had a patient who had what looked like was one lesion, looked like an ingrown hair. It was about three weeks ago and had lymphadenopathy and everybody thought it was an ingrown hair until he tested positive later on. And so you can see there were small little lesions and then the top right is two days later, and you can see the progression. And you can see this little dark area in the middle of these bumps as it scabs over. And that's something that we have here showing you that it's scabbed over. So this was initial, then two days later, and then you can see the progression. And you can also see the expression on this individual's face. Again, these are some pictures from the UK where you see lesions on the hand, 
on the pubic bone and on the lip and around the lip. The patient's main complaint on the person that I showed you two slides ago had to be, it was oral pain. So although these were not attractive and you don't wanna go out in public with a look like this, this patient's main complaint other than the aesthetics was he couldn't swallow. And if you look at the posterior oropharynx, you can see these ulcers. So you have to take into consideration, has this person had ulcers before? And so since this is a viral disease, normally I would write steroids for something like this, but it would be somebody who would have recurrent ulcerations. These are not recurrent. This was the first time these patients had, this patient had these lesions. So you would see this area and you would immediately refer to primary care. Um, this is not something I want us to be testing for at this time, although we will be discussing, hopefully, in the relatively near future, point of care testing for other disease states. Wound care. Don't forget about wound care and monkeypox. Hydrocolloid spot dressings or acne pimple patches are the perfect size and important for wound healing because they absorb pus drainage. They prevent scabbing, so the area will heal sooner, prevent super infection, and hopefully reduce scarring. That's another issue that we have to be concerned with. For oral pain management, Gel Clear is back on the market. It is a prescription topical that is used. It is indicated for mucositis secondary to radiation and chemotherapy. Opioids, when indicated, 2% viscous lidocaine, it gives you some brief release. And uh, my least favorite thing to talk about, which is magic mouthwash, which is a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But it does have some viscous lidocaine. It does have something that'll help it stick around. This is not fungal, so a little nystagmus isn't going to really help much. But it does give some peace of mind. So gel clear is an option opioids when indicated. And if you see an ulcer like this, and it's the first time a patient has had something like this, this is one time that I say we need to work in, con in concert with our primary care provider, especially someone who might be more familiar, such as our infectious disease uh, colleagues. So as always, it has been a pleasure presenting this information. Um, We'll be back, but we really want to hear topics because we heard that you wanted to hear about monkeypox, so we're covering monkeypox this month. If something comes up that's interesting or that is of concern to you, please don't hesitate to comment. I'm sure uh, Dr. Severance will have more to say, but as always, it's been an honor and privilege to be able to present to you today. Dr. Severance? Thank you, Dr. Resnick, for the continual updates, and thank you for watching. Please email us any questions, concerns, or requests for future topics at webinars at henryshine.com. And please subscribe to our YouTube page by clicking the subscribe button below. And to be notified of any premieres, click the bell icon. Thank you once again for your attention. Please stay safe and stay informed.